Hello, everybody. Um, now, I am a speech and language therapist, as Rachel said, and we are not known for our brevity, so we like to talk. Please just let me know if I go on too much. Very, very glad to be here. Very, very glad to be able to explain what I do for a living. Um, actually, I'm a bit of an imposter in the childhood section. I work with, with adults um, in my job at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. Um, my background is in voice disorders, head and neck cancer, and any disorders of the upper airway. So anything that involves swallowing, speaking, or the voice, or breathing, um, that's what I try and help with. Now, um, I, I first was introduced to dystonia seven years ago by an ENT consultant that I work with, Professor Ray in Sheffield, and he wanted to set up a clinic dedicated to people with vocal dystonia and oromandibular dystonia. So dystonias that affect your swallowing, your speech, or your voice. Um, I was very keen to do so, and now, thankfully, we have a multidisciplinary team in Sheffield comprising of myself, the ENT consultant, and a neurophysiologist. And I don't think we could function without each other. Now, thinking about communication, it's already been mentioned, communication is so important everywhere, particularly in the world of dystonia. Now, this is a very old study on this slide here from 1971. Um, but the chap who uh, published this study was looking at two separate studies in himself, and he pointed out that it's not so much what we say to people, but how we say it the sound of our voice, and our non-verbal communication. So me as a speech and language therapist, I use my hands quite a lot. Okay, you'll probably notice as I go on. And, but it's very important what we do while we're saying things. Um, now laryngeal dystonia strikes at the heart of that. It alters um, your voice. Your voice changes as you grow, as the anatomy inside your throat grows. Your anatomy is your anatomy and nobody else's. The sound of your voice changes depending on whether you're in a quite a huge room like this or a bathroom or a church. It sounds different. And inside as well, you have your resonant chambers that you can be in control of. The laryngeal dystonia makes you feel out of control, as some of you will know. Um, it also is very commonly um, associated with cervical dystonia of the neck um, and oromandibular dystonia. <coughs> and also, actually, I'm going to click on when we're ready. The, the first one it sounds like is coming on is an abductor dystonia. That means the vocal cords are, want to pull apart. So it's very difficult to get the vocal cords together to make a certain sound. <coughs> When I throw them, I throw them and drop them in the air, I throw them and throw them in the air. Actually, they're both playing together, so it's very, very confusing. It says on that slide there, it's very rare to have mixed dystonias, but you just got them there. Uh, the first type of dystonia is adductor dystonia, where the vocal cords want to spasm together, so that the voice sounds very, very tight, very strangled, um, and very croaky. Um, the second dystonia that you might have made out there makes your voice sound very breathy and very weak. Um, either one of those is very, very difficult to deal with. Um, now, when we're looking at diagnosis here, it's not an easy diagnosis, and we've already heard today how difficult it is to get a diagnosis of, of dystonia in any part of the body. Um, but most patients that I see have been months and months, if not years, sometimes decades, before they actually get the right diagnosis. Um, and going all that time without a diagnosis is psychologically debilitating. One patient of mine now doesn't talk to her parents because they spent years telling her it was all in her head and to stop doing it. Um, so moving on from, from there, we'll have a look at laryngeal dystonia in the context of us as human beings. It can be affected by, by health, anything else that's wrong with us, our, our mood and how we're feeling. Anxiety and stress is a big thing here. Many of my patients are affected by anxiety and stress. The more anxious they feel, the worse the dystonia gets. And it's a vicious circle because as soon as they start to think about opening their mouths to speak, the anxiety begins. Um, some people, when they get anxious and stressed or really frustrated, the dystonia gets better. I have a patient that Sheffield is awful for parking. As soon as she gets to me, she's frustrated with the parking. The first 10 minutes, she has an absolutely clear voice until the dystonia starts to creep in again. So everybody is so very, very different. Now, what I've found when I'm dealing with people with dystonia, laryngeal dystonia, is um, 
I need to experiment. My background with voice disorders helps me do that. What I try and do is look at the person as a whole. How are you using your voice? Is there any way that we can use your voice in a slightly different way? Often people with laryngeal dystonia can sing, can laugh um, very freely. But as soon as they start to, to try to talk in a conversation, that's when the difficulty comes in. So I try and use techniques that we use in singing and in laughing to try and come in from a different angle and help people to use their voice in different ways. So what happens with people with laryngeal, laryngeal dystonia over time is that the struggle in itself causes other problems. So posture starts to change. Um, as soon as you're struggling with your voice, people might start to raise their heads or, or dip their heads or perhaps just retreat from trying to, to interact with people in the way they're used to. Breathing can change. So it's not just the vocal cords themselves, but the support underneath that changes. Disordered breathing patterns can happen. People often say, I feel very short of breath. I can't get my breath. There's no way I can breathe while I'm speaking. Often it is because they're trying to take too much breath in, so they're hyperventilating. As they're breathing in, too much air is going in. So what we focus on a lot of the time is breathing out and trying to get in control of that. I will come back to that very, very briefly in a moment. Um, we look at resonance of the voice. We look at pitch. We look at volume. Everything to do with what makes your voice your voice. Now, I'm looking forward to hearing more about psychology later on today, um, dystonia and mental health. It's a huge issue as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure nobody here would disagree with that. It is a chronic, chronic neurological condition, um, and as yet, unfortunately, we know there's no cure. Um, anybody dealing with that on a long-term basis will be affected psychologically. Um, what I found as well, though, the treatment that most of my patients have, um, a lot of them have... Uh, botulinum toxin injections, which can be extremely effective for some people, for a lot of people. It can vary, though, over time, as we all know. Um, and dealing with those variations is not easy. So my job is, between clinics, helping people to identify what happens to your voice in between clinics. After botulinum toxin injection, do you get a worse voice first of all? Does it get very weak first, then become a little bit uncoordinated, and then you get a good voice for a few weeks, and then what happens? So it's the fluctuation that I can help people deal with, and other speech and language therapists too. This is a quote from one of our patients. So she's had the, the problem for so long, she's confused about what is her voice, where is my voice, I've lost it, I've no idea where my voice is. So a lot of our work is exploring, helping her to explore and find out where that voice is. So the MDT, or the multidisciplinary team that I work in, I've already mentioned, ENT, neurophysiology and speech and language therapy, psychological support, I wish we had more of, we need more of it, um, and also clinical nurse specialists and physiotherapists, everybody is a big team, um, and not forgetting the patient in the middle, the most important part of the team. Now, botulinum toxin I've already mentioned, and it is, it is life-changing for many people. But, as I said, we need to deal with the situations whereby you are not in the Goldilocks situation, where your voice is not too croaky, not too weak. It's somewhere in between the, where you can manage. Anywhere out of that, we need to think of ways that we can manage it. So speech and language therapists, as I say, we're trained to deal with swallowing. We're trained to deal with voice issues, we're trained to deal with speech issues. So for me, we're perfectly placed to try and help. Um, unfortunately, in the literature, there is not evidence to support us being there. Um, I am hopeful in time we will get there, but in the meantime, what we need to do is agree that we can do something. Me, I absolutely believe that we can. Um, I see patients on a weekly basis. I have one day dedicated for laryngeal and, and uh, oromandibular dystonia, and I absolutely, truly believe that together we can do something about this. Um, this is a lovely pie chart. Um, everybody likes a good pie chart, as Tim said yesterday. Uh, what we can see here is the dark green, that's the amount of patients that have botulinum toxin injection only. The light green is speech and language therapy only, so some people choose not to have botulinum toxin. The yellow bit is both. So, and that, that's what I believe is helpful for most people with laryngeal or oromandibular dystonia. Now, um, 
the speech and language therapy within the clinic, my role is, is that my 15 minutes? <laughs> my role is to help with diagnosis. Sometimes to perform laryngoscopy or having a look inside the throat with a camera, the ENT surgeon is there to diagnose, make sure there's nothing there um, that um, shouldn't be there. So make sure that the diagnosis is of dystonia. Um, neurophysiologist is there to perform electromyography and to look at the neurological signs as well. Um, now, the uh, ENT consultant is there to give the botulinum toxin injections, but I am there also to assess for anything else that I can help with. In between clinics, this is a very, very important part, going back again, um, I need to liaise with patients. They need to know they have somewhere to turn to if they want to ask questions or if something's happening you don't understand. Also, um, I give one-to-one -one sessions, sessions over the telephone, with techniques, specific techniques to try and make the most of that voice. So I help patients to explore their personal patterns. What happens to you? How do you feel when it's happening? If you make your voice do this, does it make you feel better? Does it make you feel worse? Let's try it in different situations. Have a look at the breathing, have a look at the posture, have a look at the resonance, have a look at the upper body tension that's not related to torticollis. Okay, so here's the passage, the rain down passage. Can you read This that? is a lady with adductor dystonia. Right. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. Yeah. The rainbow... Haven't got time to play all that, unfortunately. What that does is it takes you all the way through the different noises um, that I will make with that patient. I'm going to do this very briefly with you as I round off instead, just to wake us up before coffee. Um, now, don't worry, I'm not going to make you do anything that's embarrassing because you're all sitting down and it's me that'll be embarrassed. Now we're looking at, first of all, posture. As you're sitting there in your seats, if you are able, the important thing for communication, for using your voice, is to make sure that everything is as neutral as possible as far as your body allows. So when we are anxious, when we are stressed about making our voices, our shoulders tend to rise up. Our heads tend to move as well, but try and neutralise this as much as you possibly can and open out your chest to allow your lungs to do their job. The balloon analogy is a very useful one. When we breathe air in, we expand. Our rib cages go up and out, and when the air comes out, they go back again. And the lower abdominal muscles are very important here too. So, what I'd like you to do, first of all, everybody in your seats, is put one hand... right down below on your lower abdominal muscles and one hand at the top on your chest. I want you to take a big deep breath in and feel where you feel the movement. So did anybody feel the chest move? Yeah, good. <laughs> did you feel your abdominal muscles move? Yes, good, good, good. Now, what we want to do is focus on the breath out. If I focus on the breath in, many people here will start to hyperventilate. So on the breath out, everybody, keep your, keep your hands there and just imagine you're blowing out a birthday candle. So after three, one, two, three. Okay, very quickly. And you should feel those muscles contract there. Yep. Now, what I want you to do is to do that with a sound. Let's all do a shh and feel those muscles move in. Now the air going forward is what you're going to use for your voice. So moving on very quickly again, resonance is very important, whether you're an opera singer, an actor, or just somebody trying to use your voice. Now, try and use your voice like this and let's see what the room sounds like. Try a ah. Oh, that sounds very relaxing. <laughs> and now try a hmm. So again, it sounds different already. And try, if you can, let's try a meow. So already you're louder without actually trying too much. You're doing very, very intricate changes within your larynx to make those sounds. Well done, everyone. OK. Now, volume, very important. Not to be too loud, not to be too quiet. <laughs> Moving swiftly onwards again to pitch. Very important. People with laryngeal dystonia tend to sit within a very narrow band of pitch range because it feels safe to be there. But what that actually does is it makes things squeeze a little bit more and it makes you feel a little bit more out of control. 
Some people find it easier to talk in a slightly higher pitch or a slightly lower pitch, and that's what I help people to explore. So let's just together, let's do a woo. Fantastic. Okay, very, very good. We're going to split you into three now. What I'd like you to do, first of all, on this side, I want you to blow me a raspberry. Now, the reason we're doing this is, is not for no reason at all. This is one way of bringing the focus of your resonance and your voice to the front instead of the back. Dystonia wants to bring the voice backwards and hide the voice. What we're trying to do today, this morning, is bring your voice forwards and the resonance forwards and relax these muscles here. So this lot of people here, if you could, blow me a raspberry like this. <laughs> and now try and do it with some voice. And if you can't do that, try and roll your R's. Very good. Let's try the middle section. So choose a or a One, two, three. Very good. And this section here? One, two, three. Okay, very good. More sedate over that way, I think. Okay. <laughs> very good, everybody. Now, to round off, what we're going to do is help you use your voice again in a different way. We're going to hoot like an owl. Now, this does very specific things to the muscles and the structure within here. Most people with laryngeal dystonia, I can get to do something like this as a key a way into using their voice. Once we've opened that door, then we can start to explore and try using the voice in a different way in conversation. But this is where it all begins. So again, over this side, first of all, I would like you to try a woo-hoo. <laughs> woo-hoo. Okay, this section here, you're not so sure. Ho ho. Ho 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 ho. Well done. And this one over here. Woo! Well done, everybody. So you've all proved that you can get that resonance in your voice and hopefully you are very, very warmed up for coffee, which is any minute now. This is my last slide. So what, what I would say is for the future, what I dearly, dearly want to do is work with other speech and language therapists, work with other professionals and work with patients to explore laryngeal and oromandibular dystonia further together gather some information gather some data let's find out the patterns let's see what helps and what doesn't help and see if we can formulate a master plan for the future so that together we can find our voices thank you very much is that okay yes is that all right so sorry about that Karen, before you descend down the stage, just to say thank you, because you've, you've pulled off the impossible, actually. You've been inspirational, funny, you've engaged with the audience, you've actually delivered your message, and you've got us out. Actually, you've pulled back the time as well, so you've been fab. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.